Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Red Pill Tamales. <sighs> Bro, we just finished interviewing Ed Calderon. Uh, you might have seen him on Rogan. You might have seen him all over YouTube uh, doing podcasts and interviews with Navy SEALs and, and, and all that. You probably follow him on Instagram. But uh, if you do not, buckle up, get ready. Um, we've been talking about, on this show, RPT, we've been talking about the border crisis. We've been talking about fentanyl, um, human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, the state of Mexico, um, just a lot of these subjects. And there's no better guest or, or author authoritative voice uh, from an inside perspective than Mr. Ed Calderon. And uh, Rob, what you think, man? Dude, I, I legit... I, I don't. I can't even put it into words. I thought it was that good, mm -hmm. and especially like the last 10, 15 minutes, he really summed up the whole conversation. I think we've been kind of hammering for the last six months mm -hmm. in a really good and concise way that is going to be as maybe Desanta says, it's uh, irrefutable. Irrefutable. Uh, but it was really awesome. It was great. It's good to hear from from him, right? Like you said, somebody who's had boots on the ground kind of mm -hmm. thing uh, comes from that literally upbringing, mm -hmm. born and raised there, to come here and to understand you know the dynamics of both countries really, really well. That was awesome. Yeah, he's ex-law enforcement. Uh, his job used to be to kick down doors to the cartel, you know, on drug organizations in Tijuana mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Ed Calderon. It is an honor. Um, he's, I guess, American now. Yeah. I'm say he's, a, he's a resident. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I, I, I dare call him a patriot. For sure. He's doing God's work. He really is. Uh, he really dropped some bombs, dropped some gems. A lot of good info. Normally, on RPT, we have premium content that's strictly for the patrons. If you're not a patron, hit us up right now. Patreon.com forward slash Red Pill Tamales. We are protected by this subscription business model. Y'all know how big tech be playing with people's freedom out here. You know, we got freedom of speech, kind of. Um, <laughs> but the only way to keep us going and keep the show going, to keep guests like Ed, you know, just keep getting the word out is take action now do it now patreon.com forward slash red pill tamales a lot of shows a lot of content there's even an app where you can log on and join the conversation we're even talking about health stuff we're, we're, we're exchanging you know taco recipes and, yep. and things of that nature um but before we get into it i am a stand-up comedian I am on tour, Freedom of Speech tour. We are headed to Ontario, California, July 14th, Oxnard, California, July 15th, Waco, July 16th, Midland, July 17th, Irvine, August 11th, San Jose, California, August 18th, Denver, August 27th through the 29th, El Paso, September 9th through the 11th. So many more dates. Hit up chingobling.com. Get your tickets now. And if you don't already notice, this is the full premium episode. This is your Friday episode that would normally only be on Patreon. But the way we did our Chingo chat this week, the Wasogo, we put it out to the public. Same thing goes for this premium RPT. It's the first one we've ever put that's supposed to be behind the paywall for everybody. So if you want more of this on every Friday, just like we do on Wednesdays, now's the time to sign up. Yeah, so what Rob is saying is <clears throat> he is a generous guy. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made that meme. Really? Yeah. About you? From the 300, yes. About you? Because yes. you're giving away free episodes? Yes. So, you know, we just finished the interview with Ed Calderon, and this was supposed to be premium content strictly for the patrons. And Rob is like, man, this was so good that we just got to just give it away, man. Let people hear what Ed has to say so that y'all can hear from him because we get so much pushback. Anytime we talk about border issues or anything like that, the crisis, people always say, oh, it's been happening. It's nothing new, chingo. You're just a sellout coconut vendido malinche Uncle Tom, Tio Tom. And, you know, nothing's changed. It's never going to stop. But Ed really hits the nail on the head by describing this isn't your grandparents border mm -hmm. this isn't what your theos and theas went through back in the day everything about it has changed um I, I love what he does you know masculinity is under attack in america yep um you know you got to be good with them hands you got to be able to cha -cha, cha -cha, pop, 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 you know what i'm saying and we're all about that i can't wait to sign up to one of his classes it's a little intimidating yeah for sure you know first i gotta make sure i practice just to be able to go do his class. Yeah, so TIA, be prepared to do that. When he does come to Houston, we're all going to go as a group and do this. That's right, the TIA. Um, but hey, without further ado, uh, shout out to Rob for reaching out to Ed. Shout out to Ed for coming through. It is an honor to be a part of the TIA, the Tamal Intelligence Agency. It is an honor to sit down with Ed Calderon. 
excellent interview. I cannot wait. I can't wait to smoke a joint with this dude, you know, throw back a couple beers, shoot the shit, pop off some guns, pop, 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 bust out of handcuffs, know how to, the motherfucker was training Mossad and shit. He know how, he know all about, he, he know how to disappear bodies. You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> Maybe not in that order. We'll do the, we'll do the guns first and then everything else. All right, y'all. I'm just, I'm fired up. I'm fired up, man. This is Red Pill Tamales, ladies and gentlemen. Spread the word. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Without further ado, Mr. Ed Calderon, Ed's Manifesto. Sass, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very, very special episode of Red Pill Tamales. Y'all know what time it is. Y'all know what I came to do, like Sam Tripoli said. It's your boy Chingo Bling, man. And today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, First of all, shout out to my producer, Rob. He won't be on camera today. Not today. Because we have a very special guest zooming in from an undisclosed location. We have Mr. Ed Calderon. How you doing, Ed? Hermano, este, un gusto y un placer que me hayas invitado. Uh, uh, currently, uh, you know, on the road. And uh, I'm sorry for missing you a few days ago, but it's, it's been crazy, um, you know, traveling around. Sí, pues no. Gracias. El placer es de nosotros. Uh, thank you, brother. We appreciate it. Um... I first caught wind about you and 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 your movement when I saw you on Joe Rogan and one specific anecdote that stood out from that interview from one of those interviews I think you've been on there a couple times with really? Yeah, yeah. So there was a a moment in time during the Trump presidency when the caravans were were coming, you know, from Honduras or something, uh, Central America, and a lot of people were speculating that they were going to go through Tamaulipas, through Texas. And uh, you called it. You said, no, not everybody in, in the groups are all just women and children, innocent people trying to be asylum seekers. Uh, they're going to go through California, through Tijuana, uh, because of beef with the setas and um, yeah. uh, in Tamaulipas. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there were 18th Street uh, uh, Barrio 18 guys, uh, you know, they weren't, uh, you know, 13th Street guys or Barrio 18 guys. And those they have a beef with the, the Zeta. So, you know, the majority of, of, of that specific uh, caravan group, you know, I mean, I saw them firsthand. And there's a bunch of videos uh, from people at Tijuana just showing the, the, the you know, guys covered in tattoos, uh, you know, um, you know, it was a hot day and they were wearing sweaters with uh, long sleeves. Uh, while the press was kind of touring some of these places, you know, um, just calling out something that I saw directly, you know, uh, when I talked about it on the, on the, uh, on that podcast, I got called, I got called a lot of names, you know, um, but, uh, you know, that's exactly where they headed. You know, they wanted to, they wanted to basically provide a show for the media and that's what we got. Yeah, man, you called it. Uh, that was very impressive because, it shows how you're able to cut through the subtleties and the nuance of what what's reality versus narrative. Um, I also saw another interview where you were doing a class in Atlanta and uh, they told you to call off the, the class because things were the riots were getting too crazy. And you said, hey, man, all, all the students signed a waiver. I'm going to take them down into the riot and we're going to observe and and see what we noticed leadership you know what's going on and you said you were sniffing people to see who was really uh someone out there rioting or, or protesting versus and eh, they're staying in their mom's basement they're bathing they're zestfully clean and then they're showing up fresh <laughs> yeah i mean uh I, i'm uh i'm an instructor I, I show people how to survive in pretty bad places uh i focus a lot on you know places with civil unrest and you know you know, non-permissive environments. And uh, I'm also three years into my experience as an, uh, you know, as a, a resident of this country. And uh, I went through a lot of horrible experiences in Mexico uh, as far as my experience, as far as the work I did down there. And now I'm in the U.S. Um, being new, trying to figure out, you know, what's going on Uh I've trained people from the government, uh, FBI, Secret Service, so a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of the uh, agencies out there as far as my experience space and what that provided as far as a perspective and how to, you know, analyze or take apart some, some you know, a group that is trying to gain control over an area. 
So I go to places like Atlanta, I experience uh, the riots in Portland, mm. and I was expecting to see some sort of, you know, I know, uh, like, uh, like a group of people that are just living out there and just trying to, you know, figure out ways of making it tough for the cops. And, and you know, what I, what I encountered were uh, snack carts being mm. pulled through the crowds with uh, granola bars and, mm. and uh, Red Bulls. What I encountered were a bunch of college professors and a few college kids, basically, that uh, are couch surfing out there um, and are being maintained by some sort of fund, you know, mm. and I, I walked with the rioters. Um, I got, uh, you know, got some of uh, the got gassed by the Portland uh, police. Uh, with uh, CS gas that wouldn't even make uh, make you sneeze, you know, it's realizing that most of it was just a weird show that was mm. being put on. Um, so, so that gas, it, it wasn't, it didn't irritate. It was weak. I mean, it, uh, if, if you know people that are listening to this that might be Portland PD can can you know attest to the fact that they're not allowed to use anything uh, of any scale that might uh, injure anybody, and it's a riot. You know, people were being set on fire. You know. And uh, they were pretty basically tied as far as what they could do, uh, and the and, and the and the protesters were also pretty tied as far as what, what they were doing. You know, again, I, I'm an outsider in a lot of ways. Uh, seeing some of that, also a, a lot of a lot of the things that I saw were basically just staged uh, yeah. events for the media. You know, that's that's really kind of like what I've been seeing as far as some of these uh, pro, the protests last year. Uh, and now with some of the things that I'm seeing on the border related to, uh, you know, people piling piling in with these uh, for the, the, these uh, current caravans, there's a lot of that as well. You know, like it's a, it's a there's it's a it's a big stage show that uh, let's see 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 if they can gather you know whatever specific attention for their 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 specific cause. Mm-hmm. So so you're saying that some of what we're seeing in terms of the uh, Central Americans coming up through the border, you're saying, can you describe that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean? Sure. Uh, I, um, I, I went, I visited one of the caravan camps that is currently in the port of San Isidro, uh, probably a few months ago, probably three months ago. Um, I was immediately uh, met with resistance as far as talking to anybody there. Mm. And, told to speak to the guy that was in charge of the media mm. <laughs> and basically the guy in charge of the media will bring out uh selected women and children that they've already scripted to talk to the media and if people are you know people don't believe this they can kind of re- research research for themselves and see what faces and voices pop up the most when when uh, news coverage is being put forth on some of these groups mm-hmm. um there's a there's a weird clear attempt by somebody uh, somewhere to support and maintain these uh, these uh, influxes of people coming through, you know, one of the most dangerous and violent uh, countries in the world, which is Mexico, uh, along one of the most violent and risky uh, in migration routes on the planet, which mm-hmm. is through Mexico, through places into into places like Texas and in California, you know. Um, Women and children are being trafficked across the country uh, in amounts that have never been seen, you know, and nobody's keeping count of how, how many women or children cross on one border to one, how many women and, and children get uh, physically tossed over the fence on, on the U.S. side. And when you visit some of these camps, you see a bunch of donated American uh, camping gear. You see donations being delivered by, you know, well-meaning, I imagine, human beings on the American side, uh, being gathered by unscrupulous characters on the caravan side, then we, then you end up seeing uh, those donations being resold on uh, uh, in, in certain street corners in, 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 in Tijuana, uh, in the open-air markets that you, you encounter on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of them have a clear message uh, from their hometowns, which is uh, the doors are open. Now is the time, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, 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 it's a weird, it's a weird uh, thing to kind of see play out in, in Mexico right now, you know? So I, I know that migrant crises, crises have been used in the past uh, by the media. Uh, I know in Europe, 
it affected um, their politics. Um, so, so you you mentioned that some of the folks that are, I guess, have some media training or scripted, and they have them in charge of pushing out the narrative. Who do you who, who would you speculate are some of the other people that aren't allowed? Like, who are they hiding, and what's what's really happening? Uh, uh, people can people can do their own research. Uh, there's a lot of videos out there online of people being interviewed, and some of the some of the migrant caravan members actually being interviewed uh, from the first caravans, where they're openly talking about being deported multiple times from the U.S. and making their way back for various crimes. I'm not saying all of them, but some of them have that uh, have those issues. Um, first time the caravan came into Tijuana, they basically threatened the locals with uh, them turning Tijuana into Honduritas, mm. uh, basically a mini Honduras. And like most Mexican border towns, Me uh, Tijuana has a, a an autoimmune system in the form of a cartel group. And they got picked up probably that, that the same night that video was published, they got picked up and, you know, horrible things probably happened to them. Um, I, I, I am aware that a lot of the people that coming in those caravans, and again, I've, I've been there, I've talked to some of these people, so I'm not foreign to the problem. I'm a native and local of Tijuana. I see that, pro I see the problem of people, uh, of, of those caravans and the, the problems that they bring with them and also the problems that they are fleeing from. Um, I see this. It's not something that's beyond my humanity to see. I'm not saying that they're all bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am saying is that some of them are very much manipulated into having a perception that the U.S. is having an open door uh, re uh, reception for unaccompanied minors. And that later on might be an opportunity for anybody to basically chain migrate into the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you, do, you are seeing a bunch of people making a killing a killing when it comes to trafficking people across the uh, the uh, the border with the U.S. because there's no way you can cross that border in some of the lesser uh, lesser um, secure sides of it without paying directly for a toll to the cartels. And when I mean paying a toll to them, I mean you have to pay your way. And if you don't pay your way, you're gonna owe. And you know, start seeing a bunch of kids on the border wearing different colored. Um, uh, you know, wrist traps, uh, you know, some, according to some, you know, they mean that you paid in full, that you haven't paid yet, or that, you know, that there's a doubt out sound in debt, maybe, maybe. So basically it's like a, you know, like a theme park ride kind of thing where some, some of them have VIP access and somebody, some of them are going to be basically indentured slaves uh, if they don't pay their, their, their coyote. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, you know, I, I understand the plight of the humanity and the plight of some of these people fleeing violence. You know, trust me, I understand that deeply. What I'm trying to put light towards or, 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 or get out there is the fact that there are very nefarious characters making millions and millions of dollars uh, through trafficking some of these children, um, through having some of them disappear on the way up. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, if you're a woman and you go through the uh, whole process of uh, going through Mexico and getting your, making your way up to the border, you know, rape is very much in the, uh, in, the, in the possibilities for you. So people need to look long and hard as far as what they're supporting yes. um, and what victims their support is creating. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, Biden flag in the middle of the encampment in San Isidro. I wonder who put so, that there. Uh, I mean, if, it, if people want, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, post that picture up so you guys can see it. But it's, it, and all of them have the same, uh, you know, message. The doors are open, come now. Wow. You know, uh, I, I saw a very disturbing image and I haven't fact checked it. I don't know how, how official it is. But supposedly there was like a little five-year-old girl who washed up, her body washed up, and I guess the animals had already eaten away at the head and, and the arm. And um, have, have you seen that? I have not seen that. Um, I have several friends of mine that are actively working on the border, both on the Border Patrol side because I've trained members of the Border Patrol and uh, people that work in Homeland Security and I've trained people on the Mexican side in Guardia Nacional. So, like, I get stories from both sides of the border. 
uh, now I'm more of an activist and I write my own uh, media content. I, I do work with a few news agencies as far as providing some insights. So I keep an eye on it. I keep my ear out for, for things like that. Sometimes I get message, messages and videos and pictures of stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not too sure about the veracity of the, the, the body being found, but mm-hmm. there's a lot of videos of kids physically being thro- toddlers, being thrown over the border fence mm-hmm. uh, and just screaming out to the border patrol agent so they can they get picked up. Mm-hmm. And... <sighs> Again, that's not that's not that 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 kid being tossed over the border isn't a free ride. There's nothing humanitarian about that that the coyotes are doing, you know. Yeah. Uh, and you, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's it's interesting that uh, that the villains in that story and uh, 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 for a lot of Americans are the border patrol catching yeah. those, ca- basically capturing some of these kids. Yeah. yeah um I, I don't know if you're familiar with my my past as a rapper or comedian but uh one of my big slogans was they can't deport us all so the way the reason i was putting that out there is because back during the bush era i was seeing a lot in the media that that uh, immigrants and latinos were getting scapegoated and you know demonized and um you know i was coming at it from the perspective of you know the son of immigrants and just having a big heart. So I was really pushing that. But fast forward, now that I start to see that everything about that game has changed, everything you just described about the harsh realities of what happens to women and kids and, and you know, some very unspeakable things, um, I definitely changed my tune because yeah, I, yeah. I, I cannot promote that. Uh, do people need to get the, the uh, coming to America... Uh, from the 80s image out of, out of their out, out of their minds you know uh it's not it's not a bunch of dudes uh, that take it upon themselves to cross the desert alone and figure out the american dream it's about a bunch of dudes getting picked up by a coyote or by a cartel group getting extorted some of them getting a backpack placed on their backs with who knows what you know uh it's uh, the prettiest uh, ladies coming into the border, getting picked out and being sent elsewhere. Mm-hmm. It's uh, people going missing in the desert. You know, it's uh, killing fields on the border. It's uh, it's uh, you know, it's human trafficking, sex trafficking. It's it's uh, it's uh, drug trafficking at a scale that hasn't been seen ever. You know, um, it's 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 a lot of things, but it isn't humble people coming uh, from the middle of, uh, of Mexico, making their way up and crossing the desert and not, you know, not paying a coyote or, you know, just, it, it's not that anymore. That's not the, the commonality. The commonality is a GI business on the border. The cartels, um, the second biggest cash cow is human trafficking. That's just, just the, uh, you know, if they control the border, they control the access points. Um, so people need to kind of separate those the idea that weird you know story uh, stories of their grandparents or their, or their parents coming to the U.S. because that's not the stories that you're you're seeing now. Those are completely different stories now. But the story has changed, um, and it's changed along with the proliferation of some of these criminal groups in Mexico and them going transnational. They're not only controlling the border crossing, but they're also uh, controlling some of the distribution that these people now that are basically owing or indentured servants to some of these criminal groups, they, 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 now some of these criminal groups actually have a say as far as where they go and who they work for and they tax, they get taxed, you know? So it's a business, it's a giant multi-million dollar business that is being run by some of these criminal organizations. It's not the, uh, El Abuelo coming from Michoacan crossing the desert with a water jug anymore. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that, that should be, out of people's minds yeah and i'm glad people can hear it from you because i tell people all the time they're like oh dude you sold out our raza que este wey vendido pinche malinche like when i stopped promoting the they can't deport us all thing because what you just said is the reason why i'm like whoa 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 the everything about it has changed uh it's it's uh you know i'm uh i came i came to this country without anything uh legit um immigrant uh, 
uh, migrated, went through the went through the process of migration at the most difficult and worst times to go through it. I think in our in the re- recent history, you know, uh, my process took uh, a while, and it was because um, President Trump got elected, and everybody saw that as a closing door for immigration. So the process was insanely long, insanely difficult. Everything was scrutinized. It was not an easy thing to go through. And then seeing people skip all that, you know, mm-hmm. with a dubious past and or, um, you know, things that are openly known about them going through the process, uh, you know, skipping that line, you know, is it it's, it, it, it's unsettling for somebody like me that went through it that way. Um, also, I have the experience of actually fighting and going after some of the uh, people that traffic some of these individuals now into the country. So I know what that's like. Uh, and kind of kind of being on being in being in the U.S. and being a voice of somebody, hey, I'm new here and I'm aware of how things can go really bad in a country. And I'm seeing some of that here, you know. And, you know, no hay peor enemigo de un mexicano que otro mexicano. You know, there's no worse enemy for a Mexican than another Mexican. And I get it. I get called out, you know, so, so called out as well. Mm. You know, but I, I'm from, I'm born in Tijuana. So when I speak of uh, of Mexico, I'm, I'm not speaking of going to Mexico for Navidad or mm. New Year's. You know, I'm, I'm speaking of experience, yeah. you know. Uh, when I speak about some of the lacks and wants in the immigration process and how it could be better. And how it's being, you know, manipulated by some people. I'm speaking from direct experience, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's disheartening sometimes to see some of the, uh, the people, the people that call themselves Latinx or, mm. or or that wave the Mexican flag about telling me, hey, Ed, you only talk about the bad stuff, you know, what about the good stuff? So I wasn't a tourist. Uh, I I didn't work for the tourism department in Mexico. You know, I worked in law enforcement, and I got to see the worst parts of it. Mm-hmm. Um, not the not the good ones, and those are the, one, the those 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 bad parts are the ones that I kind of I use as a as a as a as a uh, reference when I when I when I talk about some of my experiences down there, and how I'm seeing it reflected in some experiences I'm now encountering in the U.S. How uh, how this weird, how this cartel problem that we are experiencing is a regional problem, not a Mexico problem. You know, mm. it's a regional problem. Uh, it's a regional because it affects both sides of the border because they work on both sides of the border and this whole concept of you fighting a war against it like you fight a war against ISIS overseas with predator drones is completely ridiculous and outside of the realm of reality Mm -hmm. you know yeah definitely Um, I definitely want to talk about some of the things that you're seeing here in America that are concerning to you uh but but before we jump into that i just want to uh, wrap up like all the border stuff uh one of my conspiracy theories is that is that uh you know se escucha mucho de los túneles right there's tunnels everybody yeah. it's well there's, it's well documented there's tunnels one of things uh, one of the things that I, uh, I i uh believe and i don't know if there's any evidence to it but that they're possibly trafficking women and kids through those tunnels Okay. Um, according to what I know in my experience with tunnels, because I, I got to see a few in my time, uh, there's somewhere in the vicinity of 50 active tunnels on the border, according to some people. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but it's a number that I've heard kind of tossed around. Um, tunnels are high value, high value items. Um mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't see a tunnel that is capable of transporting a human being uh, used for trafficking of people. Myself, I wouldn't see it that way. Uh, it's too much of a risk. It's too much of a risk for somebody talking to, mm-hmm. to, to talking about an interest, to talking about an exit. Uh, the borders are very porous. You don't need a tunnel to move people through it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I, I, and real, realistically, most of those tunnels are are built in areas where there's an urban and urban sprawl underneath them so they can basically hide how they get out uh i've not i've not encountered in my time active uh, or even in my time out of it uh just through keeping in touch with some of the people that are still active 
of tunnels being utilized to move people. That's not the, not that's not 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 nothing that I've seen has mm-hmm. led me to believe that that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have seen people get on um, you know private boats in Rosarito and they basically get you know just uh, just dock in San Diego and just to have a few people just you know run out. Um, I have seen uh, people uh, rent passports and IDs of people that look like them mm. in, in, on the U.S. side and just basically borrow their car and drive back into 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 the U.S., you know? Okay, so the, the, my theory has been debunked, <laughs> and, and that's why it's good that uh, we have somebody with insight. Yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, women and children are being trafficked across the border just by making them walk in a straight line, you know, swimming through a river. Uh, being dumped, literally dumped uh, across the border and uh, having the script ready to talk to the border patrol agents. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a very big risk for a criminal group to utilize a tunnel to move people when it can make, you know, billions off the same tunnel if, if nobody talks about it, you know. That's why I don't think it's, mm-hmm. it's probably, a, I don't think it's probably related uh, in, in that regard. Okay. Um one thing too, uh, there's a gentleman named Nigel Farange. He's from Europe, Britain, and um, he's he's like a political figure. He's very involved in politics and stuff. He recently took a trip to Arizona, and I'm going to paraphrase what what he described. He said he witnessed people, you know, pagando la cuota, you know, paying the coyote and the cartel and stuff, um, getting trafficked through an Indian reservation, and then wearing like camouflage and fatigue fatigues he said they were all like fighting age uh like young males that they would uh lay low during the daytime because of the sun and then at night they would hike with you know the carpet shoes the gallons are blacked out for reflection and that about 60 miles north of the border they'd go through dairy farms and get to the edge of the highway where basically in his opinion criminal organizations and gangs will pick them up and then distribute them as foot soldiers in different urban areas in America. So w- his argument is that we're importing a criminal class into our country, and your imagination can go from there. Uh, yeah. have, have you heard uh, any, anything? So, I mean, all, all the equipment you describe is also part of the business the cartel has. They, they, they equip, if you're going to cross the border, you need a you know, backpack with food and, and rations. You need this black uh, water jug because it doesn't reflect in the sun. Carpet shoes to keep from getting tracked, which are pretty negligible now with the amount of foot traffic going across the border right now. It's, you know, pretty negligible. And yeah, you're, uh, and, and if people are curious about, about some of these kids being utilized to traffic drugs across the border, then kind of being dispersed in the U.S., there's a bunch of videos on TikTok out of all places where they're just, just, Hey, I'm here uh, in Mexico. And now I'm here crossing the desert. Hey, look at that's the border patrol helicopter. He didn't see us. And now they're in El Paso somewhere, or somewhere uh, in Arizona, just to, in, in a, in a public place, you know, just kind of chilling. Uh, I think the, 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 the importation of criminals into the U S is, I don't know. I don't know if I would use that word, uh, but you are seeing an acceptance of that type of activity in the U.S. I mean, uh, the, the, the two largest cartels in Mexico, which is the Sinaloa cartel and the New Generation cartel, clearly have distribution in the U.S. set up. Not just that, but manufacturing. Uh, they run illegal grows in marijuana in places where it's legalized. Um, they run protection for hire, they run extortion, they, I mean, they control the border, you know. Uh, I think what you're seeing is not a, it's not an importing a criminal class, it's getting used to it and or accept, being accepting of it uh, is what I see, or normalizing it now. Um, you know, there was a recent case of a high school teacher that tr- that tried to rip off a uh, a cartel group, and he got you know severely you know paid back for it, and that, that was kind of out in the open. Like some breaking uh, breaking bad type shit. Breaking bad type shit. Uh, it's not uncommon for you know cartels to enforce their their territory now in, in the U.S. like that, and even in places like Canada, you're starting to see some activity that's really out in the open. 
Um, I, I, I think more so than importing a criminal class, you're just you're, you're starting to see it being very overt in its actions. It used to be kind of underground. Now it's very out in the open because of the sheer volume of it going on. Um, and you can kind of trace it to the permissive nature that some states are now having towards the, you know, the the the, uh, the use of certain uh, certain substances that used to be illegal are now legal. And um, you know, I'm I'm pro weed. You know, it's fine, it's just a plant. Oh, wow. uh, but with but but with it, you know, but with it comes other things. You know, um, you legalize marijuana in California. All the all of the weed fields in Mexico got turned into poppy fields, and now you have heroin laced with fentanyl. Eesh. You know, or now you have illegal weed grows in California, um, uh, in public lands, in federal lands, they're, they're growing weed, or in some you know farms, just and they'll, they're cartel operated, right? And, and so we and we in the U.S. distributing in the U.S. And setting up in the U.S. That's not a that's not a Mexican cartel problem anymore. You know. Yeah, and we all know where the fentanyl comes from. Everybody that listens to Red Pill Tamales is well versed in this uh, criminal multinational <laughs> organization, and we all know where the fentanyl comes from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna. You know, I, I don't work for Disney. You know, so I, I can say it. You know, it all comes from China. It's us. It all come. It all comes from uh, from China. And the only criminal group in Mexico that grew even during the COVID shutdown was the New Generation Cartel. And the only reason they did that is because they had control over the Pacific side ports in Mexico. And ain't nothing coming out of China that the Chinese state doesn't know about. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's no such thing as a, a criminal uh, underworld of China, you know. Yeah, it's it, all that, that's that, that, that nothing comes out of China without China knowing. It's all um, state sanctioned. Yeah. And so now I think that, that what you're seeing now and the move with fentanyl, as far as what it's turning into, uh, you're starting to see, and this is coming from people that I, I know that are still in the, in, in the fight down south, uh, you're starting to see uh, bogus uh, pain medication presses to make pills that look like, uh, like uh, prescription opiates. Um, you're starting to you're starting to see them package things in that way, you know, getting really close to quality as far as um, somebody that knows their pain medication will have a hard time picking between which is the bogus one and the real one, you know. That's another evolution to the problem that's gonna that's that's already happening in the United States, and it's gonna make it harder for some people to detect things going across or. You know, somebody that actually has a legit need to take a pill now it takes a pill and it's all of a sudden he's uh you know, he's he's in heaven watching Chelino Sanchez uh, play a concert with Tupac, you know, some weird <laughs> shit like that. <laughs> Damn. So uh I have a lot of family well, my family comes from Estamaulipas, and lately, recently I've been hearing some rumblings about some activities, some shootings, uh, uh some friction. Uh are you able to speak on that? Do you know anything about that? Uh, that's not my, that's specifically that area that I, I, I didn't experience directly in my in my uh, in my time there down there. But we, what you are seeing is one major cartel force basically allying itself with uh, other regional groups. Um, what what's coming is a uh, is a direct collision with between the two major cartel forces in Mexico. And Tamaulipas is going to be part of it. You know, a lot of the a lot of the things you're you're seeing in, in certain northern regional parts of Mexico. Are proxy groups related to the Sinaloa cartel basically fighting it out for control of territory? What I mean by proxy groups, I mean the Sinaloa cartel isn't isn't the solidified single leadership cohesive cartel that a lot of people might think they are. They're a federation of several small groups and and, and proxy groups that are uh, that have been entrenched in the fabrication, sales, and trafficking of narcotics from Mexico into the U.S. for decades. Um, but we're trying to. What you're seeing now is a very, you know, ultraviolet militaristic, uh, militarized cartel in the form of the New Generation Cartel, uh, expanding, just expanding. Every week, it's just a new expansion. You know, um, they're going into towns and wiping out the local cartel and installing their own kind of like policing force in some of these regions and areas. Uh, they're seeking ally chips with other uh, criminal organizations uh, in Mexico on the northern side of uh, northeastern side of Mexico. They absorb elements of the Gulf Cartel. Um, they're looking for weird connections and alliances to expand the, the, their influence in Mexico. They're getting political. Uh, this last election cycle in Mexico, 
saw the, the the execution and murders of several candidates running for mayorship on on, on both sides of the political aisle um, down south. So if, if anybody wanted to doubt that the cartels are politicized and that's why they shouldn't be considered as a terrorist organization, you know, they need to reanalyze that uh, definition, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, what you're seeing right now all over Mexico is expansionism, expansionism and leading towards some sort of weird, I mean, uh, imagine a imagine a civil war with multiple fronts, you know, between government forces, cartel forces, and cartel forces allying themselves with certain local police forces. It's gonna it's it's, it's gonna turn into uh, it's gonna turn into something interesting. Um, and you know, usually that that sort of destabilizing uh, uh, agent in the region leads for more you know displacement of people. You know, uh, I think uh, I think. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised as far as how much people, how many, how, how many people could move from an area to another, if uh, if one of these dominant forces kind of sets itself or settles itself into a prolonged fight, you know, in the northern north north uh, north uh, northern regions of Mexico, you know, yeah. uh, it's going to displace a lot of people. Oh man, that sounds scary. Um, what are some things that you're witnessing here? in the United States that are alarming or of concern or maybe something that's like, oh, that reminds me of something I've seen elsewhere? Uh, I mean, the the corrosion and degradation of police forces all over the country, you know? You know, I, get, I was a cop in Mexico, which is probably not the most luxurious and or... Uh, we, we don't we, we didn't have the best reputation on the planet as police officers, that's all I'm going to say, you know? Mm. Uh, but but I did my job. I came out clean. Uh, I never took anything that wasn't mine. I, I, I remained clean for as long as I could and until I couldn't. Then I just fucking quit. Um, so I'm not saying it's the same experience that I had in the U.S., but think about it now. Uh, everywhere I go in the U.S., police recruiters tell me the same thing. You know, recruitment is down. Uh, people coming out, generations are are, are small. Uh, nobody wants to grow up to be a cop because they, they, the police officers just basically went through a, I don't know, five-year campaign uh, as far as them being the bad guys. Uh, they need to be canceled. Uh, they're, they're, all of them are murderers and, you know, all this type of uh, mental program that, programming that a lot of kids are getting now. Um, the recruitment is down and corrosion and, and just confidence in police forces is down, which if I'm, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a fox, that's what I want, right? Mm-hmm. If I want to, if I'm a fox and want to go into the hen house, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to, I want the farmer to think that the dog, that the, the guard dog, yeah, it's a waste of time, you know, mm-hmm. or is part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, with so you, you can directly correlate some of the corrosion of some of these police uh, groups and you know police uh, recruitment and lack of police in some places, you know. Uh, to how things are getting, you know, worse in some parts. Uh, how, you know, people are utilizing uh, some of these opportunities uh, to expand their criminal enterprises in places where drugs are now very permissive, where police forces are the enemy and viewed as the enemy by the, the population. And it reminds me a lot of Mexico in some places where, you know, some of these groups are now losing uh, validity as far as... Uh, you know, as far as uh, as far as a, a group to be trusted, you know, corrosion, uh, corrosion of confidence in, 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 in the public trust. That's again, that's something I've seen and I see where it leads, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very alarming. You, you got a question, Rob? Yeah. Ed, um, could you speak uh, kind of to segue into like what's going on right now? I know I'm off camera, but real quick, if you could speak in your own words about administrations right now, what we saw, what was going on under Trump, and I know our audience would love to hear your perspective of what's going on right now, whether you want to talk about the theatrics or the theater of it all or the actual sure. policies taking sure. place right now. Like, wh- how do you see everything unfolding? Sure. Um, well, I mean, for, for first off, I'm, I'm, you know, people ask me if I'm a Trump supporter or I'm a Biden supporter. I'm a, I'm a permitted resident, so I can't even vote. <laughs> um, but I, you know, if you don't turn on to politics, politics will turn on you. So that's uh, my always been my stance. So I keep an eye on things. Uh, during the Trump administration, basically, the U.S. decided to outsource its border protection policy to Mexico. Uh, and 
the way they did it is they strong armed the current administration in Mexico, which is run by a man named Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Um, if people want to know a bit about him, he's a he's a leftist, open uh, Maduro Chavista guy, um, a populist guy. Um, he had a he had a he had a weird relationship with Trump and the Trump administration specifically basically one kind of based out of mutual respect. Uh, Trump uh, pr- provided political pressure to Mexico to fortify its southern border by threatening it with tariffs. You know, and that's how that's how that's how that relationship was formed. Um, and you saw the creation of this. Uh, police force called the Guardia Nacional, which is basically the extinction or the, they got rid of the federal police and they made it Guardia Nacional. So they made militarized police force from Mexico, which should be concerning to, to some people in Mexico if they don't know if, if, if they don't know what that can lead to. Um, but uh, they basically outsourced uh, the border protection to them. Uh, it, 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 uh, it worked. You know, it worked for a time. You know, you saw the first caravans come up and then you, they kind of stopped. They figured that the, the doors were closed, that they weren't welcome. And uh, they kind of quickly figured out that, you know, the Trump administration wasn't having anything as far as, you know, providing a space for them to be able to cross. Uh, then everything changed, you know. When I say everything changed, I mean, Biden won. And as soon as he won, the call was out. Some of the encampments that are already set were set in places like Baja uh, and got ready to receive more people. You know, um, buses were rented, uh, people were waiting. And uh, a clear a clear sign that pressure was lessening on the U.S. side as far as outsourcing its, uh, its border protection as it, it had been. And then, you know, all these caravans coming up, there's nobody on the border, on the Mexican side, covering that border or restricting access now. It's basically an open fence, you know, mm-hmm. or an open river. You know, some people get stopped, but it's realistically it's open. Um, so it went back to being open with the current administration. Uh, pressure started lessening. Uh, and, I mean, that's that's what you see. You see... You see, basically, an, like a, like a, the message was sent out that you know it's open. You know, it's, that's and it's it's pretty mind blowing now seeing uh, Kamala saying that, that that please don't come. You know, when you know on the campaign trail in a video that they, that was being posted in a lot of Facebook groups related to the caravans, uh, a video of her saying how inhumane it is. Uh, for people to be turned back at the border, how people should be allowed in and how that's inhumane. And now she's saying the opposite, right? It's like a weird meme that's being shared in some of these groups. Um, again, uh, what you're seeing now is just a, Mexico's a highway now. It's, it's a highway again. It's, it's a highway in a, in a bigger form than it was before. Um, you know, people being bussed into the border, um, people making their way through. People coming in from West Africa, you know, people coming in from Eastern uh, Eastern Europeans, kind of making their way as well. Um, Haitians, South, uh, people from all over South America, more Venezuelans being added into the mix, you know, more than more than the last few caravans. Uh, you're you're starting seeing more, just basically all types. Uh, and as somebody has seen things on both sides of the border, now you see a, a, an overstretched border protection agency that is not only tasked with border protection from uh, as far as illegal border crossings, but also narcotics coming going across the border and other nefarious activities activities that might uh, go across the border. Uh, and it's you know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird scary time, you know. Yeah, uh, the newest news with that is that Kamala is finally going to go down to the border now that the big homie, Trump, said that he was going to go down. So she's like, no, no más a ganar. <laughs> That's, fun. I mean, That's funny to me. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. It's, I mean, it's, 
it, it, it is a it is a crisis and if people don't realize the crisis i mean they i know it's a lot of people are separate from that reality but you know anybody that's lived on the border i mean i grew up in tijuana so i, I know i know what, what it was to see people just lined up on the border to try and jump it when it was a you know a moonless night with fog you know you know, perfect time to cross that border mm -hmm. and then i saw them put another the the new border fence up and i was like yeah that's a pretty cool fence but they'll they'll be able to jump it eventually you know it slows people down is what the argument was for that mm -hmm. um or it's a security feature so drugs won't jump come into the country um uh, trust me where the fence is the most secure and where the fence is the tallest it's where the most of the drugs go through you know under over you know, fully submersible uh, submarines uh, dedicated to the, the, the tra drug trafficking, something I also forecasted a few years ago, and now they found the first few ones, documented ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what it is, is a, uh, it's a control. It's a control feature. You know, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a border fence. It might not be a security feature as far as drugs go, uh, but it is a control feature as far as the flow of people going through it. Um, I understand that some of them are fleeing some horrible mm -hmm. uh, living conditions and some very dangerous places where criminal groups are, you know, doing what they do and the government doesn't give a shit and it's corrupt as hell. And some of that destabilization in some of these reasons has a historical link back to America's foreign policies. Mm -hmm. We can agree to, to, to all of that. You know, I'm a migrant myself, so I can talk a little bit about my experience as far as a migrant. Uh, but, uh, you know, OK, we see the, all the root causes to all these people. It doesn't it doesn't bury the fact that a lot of people are getting disappeared along the way. A lot of people, kids are being trafficked along the way. There's a proliferation of, of feminicides all over Mexico. Uh, there are probably a few active serial killers working uh, working in, uh, in and around the border, you know, and there's a history behind it. You know, killing fields in Juarez are an example of some of the history that some of these uh, predators will basically hide themselves in places where cartels have criminal activity and just get rid of people. You know, so satiate whatever fucking fantasies they might have. Mm -hmm. It has a historical basis. Mm -hmm. um what are you supporting when you support uh hey yeah let, let's let's just you know let everybody in you know they're not going to go across the border without paying the piper and what is that piper getting paid for you know and what do they do with that money and um, talking about the the foreign policy and immigration policy here what if you were to just look back at you know going back to reagan and before and even to now what to you looks like a good direction to take the U.S.'s uh, initiatives when it comes to immigration and people coming and going from Mexico specifically. I mean, I said, I think, I think, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, it's interesting to see a country as young as Mexico right next to the border, not being taken advantage of by one of its biggest trading partners, which is the U.S. Go to any go to any restaurant in the U.S. Go to any hotel chain in the U.S. Go to even during COVID, you know, illegal uh, workers in the fields made produce. You know, it was everywhere, even even during COVID. So there were essential workers in a way, even during COVID. You know, uh, just get over the fact that you need labor. You need workers in, in 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 this country, and there's a giant workforce willing to take that load. You know, there needs to there needs to be some sort of a regional uh, regional uh, consideration for workers coming in from Mexico. They might be seasonal. I know there's already programs like it. They need to be kind of revisited. I think reform like the bra uh, braceros, something like the braceros, which makes sense. Uh, I think again. Uh, I see a lot of the work that Mexicans do in in the U.S. I don't see us as as people that are stealing jobs. You know, I don't see us as that. Uh, I see us as a as a as a young Mexico as a, a people a country of young people. Uh, it's a very rich country. Uh, it's a rich in resources. Uh, but you know, there's a saying: Mexico tan tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca de Estados Unidos. You know. Mexico, uh, so so far from God and so close to the United States. Um, I think there's a somewhere in the core of the American, you know, 
population's uh, perception of Mexico. There is a there is a distinction or separation as far as the Mexico as a country and the U.S. as a country. And I think we've been linked both by blood and history and and uh, and commerce long enough and just, and strongly enough for years and decades that we need to reconcile the fact that how we how the U.S. treats Mexicans as a country and as a citizenship should should be reviewed. You know, there should be a difference. I'm not saying open the border and let everybody in. I'm saying that they should get specific considerations because of what they provide as far as the workforce of the U.S. And people need to get over that fact. You know, that yeah. they're needed. Yeah, they're they're needed. Play, yeah. They're the, 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 the geography, the fact that they're neighbors, the economics, like you were saying, the labor force, the supply, the demand. Uh, I agree a thousand percent. Yeah, and if you were to speak to those that, let's just pretend some of the, the liberal-ish listeners or people that might be tuning in because you're here, to get them to kind of see the perspective that we've been talking about for the last six months and you've been talking about for years now, when they say things like, this used to be, this land wasn't ours, right? This land belonged to them, it belonged to others. It kind of goes into what you've been talking about of you can't, you know, uh, romanticize the 80s immigration versus no. now. The same thing goes to, to that, right? As far as the land's property owners. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I'm you're Mexicano. Like I was born in Mexico. Uh, I got to see its problems. Uh, we are all children of conquering nations. Is one thing I will say to start off. You know, start there with that conversation. All of us are children of conquering nations, and if we were alive, it's because somebody in our past took something from somebody else, took land from somebody else did something, you know, I, I remember posting a video of the, uh, of a, uh, Native American dancing his tribal dance, uh, tribal war dance dressed in Marine Corps blues. And a bunch of comments, uh, were about, oh, that's horrible. Wearing the uniform of the nation that committed genocide against, against your people, you know, um, I saw it as a beautiful act. Somebody reconciling their present with somebody with their past, you know, the, you know, keeping some of the, the their ancestors alive. You know, if Mexicans have any strength as a culture, is that we are on speaking terms with our dead and our ancestors. Day of the dead comes, we give them bread, we give them beer, we give them a line straight to the house. That we 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 party at the cemetery. So that's not foreign to us. It's the strength we have as a as a nation. Uh, speaking of, hey, this used to be Mexico, the, the, the border, the border crossed us and all of this conversations that you hear sometimes. Uh, I'm Mexican. I, I don't, when I go to Texas, I don't view it as, hey, this, 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 this used to be Mexico, right? I don't, I don't, I don't do that. You know, that's, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's, that's, uh, that's probably at the root of a lot of the things that I think culturally is wrong with Mexico is, the weird conquered victimhood that it has that probably stems back from its you know, colonial era, uh, not reconciling our past with our present and not reconciling the fact that we are basically a mixed culture in a lot of it, uh, in a lot of parts. You know, there are natives in Mexico, but they're not like the Native Americans of the U.S., you know? Mm -hmm. They don't have casinos, you know? Mm -hmm. They are marginalized communities and uh it's they just have a different relationship with their with their roots um i'll say this um he, i escaped certain aspects of the culture you know um that i that i was born in uh and when people romanticize the whole fact that hey, the, this this used to be mexico you know um but what is mexico now you know it's beautiful in some parts. It's you know some of the best people, some of the uh, some of the best food on the planet, mm -hmm. and also there are hundreds of mothers, sisters, brothers, and fathers looking for their missing, using uh, long steel prods to poke into the ground to see if they can find putrefied uh, putrefied smells coming out of the ground. And then to see if they can DNA test any of these uh, bodies out there. Um, that is not a small portion of the population. That is not a that is not a story that is uncommon in Mexico. Um, you know, 
you are second generation, first generation American in the United States. You know, your parents left somewhere for some reason. Some of them were leaving for economical reasons, probably uh, reasons of opportunity. Cut that out of your headspace right now. The people that are leaving now are fleeing killing fields, Cambodian level killing fields in parts of Mexico where the body count isn't too clear because you know people get uh, their body disappeared in Costa Casota and nothing gets left behind. You know, you know when you're idealizing that Mexico, like what Mexico are you talking about? Because the Mexico that I experienced only a few years back um, in certain parts of it were pretty nightmarish uh, spaces and hellscapes uh, for some people. And people fleeing now are not fleeing because they don't have opportunities. Some of them are literally fleeing for their lives, you know. And I, I'm sure a few of the listeners can, can attest to this, that they, that they left because it became unsustainable for them to be there. Not because they couldn't afford to live there because it became unsustainable. You know, people fleeing because they were getting tasked by the tax, by the police, by the cartels, and family members getting abducted, you know, extortion. You know, this is the, these are the stories of the new immigrants coming into the United States, not, not the ones that are just fleeing uh, the, because they don't have uh, opportunities in Mexico. So I think people need to k- kind of start sorting that out as far as what the current narrative is and what, what Mexico currently is. That was so it was for their parents. Awesomely answered. We're the children of conquering nations. What a way to start that 10 minute rant too. That's going to be, that's going to sum up this podcast. I swear that was a great clip. Uh, every, every, it's, it's true. I mean, if you think about it, every one of us is a, is a child of a conquering nation and behind us are victims, you know, but that is something we have to reconcile, you know, uh, do I owe anything? Uh, to all the, uh, you know, conquered tribes that the Mexicas had before the Spanish came to Mexico, you know, I don't know. Uh, am I a Mexica? Am I a mixture of Spanish and, and, and Mexica and Aztec or Azteca, as, as they, they, they were later called? Um, do I owe anything to, to all these uh, Spanish people? You know, I, I don't know. Um, it's a pretty big burden to put on on somebody that you know just born with that responsibility as far as all the conquered nations that he has behind him as far as the uh, you know our genetic makeup you know we're, we're the survivors we're the ones that won the wars you know mm. that's who we are yeah that's pretty deep that's real deep and I kind of want to uh, I know we're creeping up on an hour here but since we're talking about a lot of pressure to put put on you know other <laughs> generations from the past any any uh, opinion or input on this conversation of critical race theory being taught in the United States so openly and people being so laissez-faire about it? I mean, that, uh, some of the weirder experiences I've had were in the, you know seeing the universities and some of the ideas about it by people that are going through you know some of these uh, education houses in the U.S. How, I, how some of them basically dictate to me what my experience was working in Mexico, you know, um, uh, you know how I'm being, uh, you know, as, a, as an immigrant to this country, how I'm being told to self-identify myself as or that I am Latino. This is, this is you are Latino, so this is, this is what you should be, right? And if you express any sort of uh, opinion towards, I don't know, personal responsibility, you know, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I could carry a gun to my gay best friend's wedding and smoke a joint, you know, and I want the government to, you know, leave me alone in a big way, you know, that's a, uh, that's a weird, you know, that's a weird thing to say, you know, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a belief system that I might, that I, that I, that I, that I have. Um, I, I, I have I have the I have the experience of going through corrupt governments at federal levels, at state levels, at municipal levels. So I see what that is, and I don't know. Like again, I'm 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 pretty conservative. I think you know I was raised Catholic in Mexico. I think most immigrants to the to this country get here with a weird, really weird kind of conservative point of view. Uh, and getting told who I am and what I should be thinking and or what I should be believing because of where I, where I'm from or the color of my skin or how I self-identify is pretty scary, you know. 
um, uh, it's pretty scary that uh, if I deviate in even a little bit from it, I'm going to get ostracized or cast out by a whole segment of the population that has the programming that this is who we are. So you should be, you shouldn't be spouting that, you know. Um, and again, I'm I'm a I'm a uh, I'm a weird uh, in betweener, you know. I wasn't born in the United States. I was born in Mexico, and I went through the immigration process. I'm new here, um, and it's disheartening for me to see second generation, third generation uh, people that call themselves Latinx people, you know, dictating to me what I should be believing or what what my what I should be saying as far as perceptions about Mexico, you know when they go down there for Christmas to visit their tia or their rancho. And I worked there, you know, I was born there and I fought there, bled there, cried there. And I still go back to try and make things better. Yeah. Yo los mando la fregada. Toma with tu pinche. <laughs> yeah, because we, we get a lot of pushback. We get a lot of pushback. Um, I'm speaking for Rob and myself uh, that we feel like we have a moral obligation to cut through the noise and just give people signal of what's objective, what's evidence based, like what is really happening. Not not the mainstream narrative, not what the TV tells us to think or believe. So we have a moral obligation to touch on these subjects, but we get so much pushback, you know, from from other Mexican Americans or, or what have you're, you. You're, you're doing something right, you know. Uh, I've gotten a lot of negativity, you know, uh, by speaking to things that will that happened, you know. Things that I can point to a, uh, to, to a five news agencies that are all sharing the same thing from videos that I directly took and or directly got from people that were there. And I share a reality and, you know, you get spat on and said that you're just propagating uh, negative stuff about a certain region, um, you know, being called, uh, you know, a traitor, uh, you know, uh, and also, man, I, I worked in one of the most uh, difficult and dangerous jobs on the planet for for a big part of my life. And now I share some of my experiences with people from the FBI, Secret Service. Uh, I just did a class for, for Homeland Security. Uh, and still, I'm called a corrupt piece of shit criminal because I worked in Mexico as a cop. And I, you know... It's it's uh you know you're not doing you're not doing anything if you don't get that I guess mm -hmm. has been has been my lesson from that it's part of the process and if you trust the process I think uh, you know is use that hate to fuel you I guess the what say the last part again uh, you can use that hate to fuel you oh I guess, fuel you know yeah yeah, yeah. no well uh, I mean we commend the work that you do, the information that you, you put out there, uh, what you stand for, what you believe in. Uh, we have your back. All the members of the, of the TIA, the Tamal Intelligence Agency, uh, we appreciate you. Um, and thank you for, for being a guest, man, and sharing your info. Uh, th uh, thank you, guys. I just want to give a quick shout out, if I can. Salud. Uh, uh, them, if people want to keep in touch uh, as far as what's going on in Mexico as criminal-wise, there's a specific news agency that I work with directly, and it's called Demoler. Uh, you can find them on Instagram. I tag them all the time. Um, it's independent. There's no, no fuckery going on there. It's well-researched. Uh, I share a lot of the information that gets to me uh, with that news source. So Demoler at, uh, at uh, Instagram. You can find them on Instagram, Demoler. So please check that out if you're interested in that. And... Uh, Thank you guys for inviting me on. This has been, it's been an awesome conversation with you guys. And 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 you're uh, at Ed's Manifesto on Instagram, and your website is edsmanifesto.com? Yeah, I'm at, I'm at, at Ed's Manifesto on Instagram. If you, if you enjoy uh, weird cartel news, if you enjoy weird stuff that I know and weird memes related to being Mexican, kind of check me out. <laughs> yeah, we love it. About the conversation. <laughs> and uh, I'm not... I'm not ex law enforcement or anything like that, but uh, I'm very curious. I'd love to take one of your classes. Uh, could you just briefly, for anyone that's listening and is curious, what are the prerequisite requirements? Uh, you have to be 18 years or older. You have to breathe and be able to walk and move around, and that's it. 
Okay. If you've ever, if you've ever been afraid for your you know, personal safety, if you've ever been curious about what uh, people need to know when going into an uh, into an environment that is not friendly to your presence there, uh, how to get out of handcuffs, how to you know how to construct handcuff keys out of garbage, you know how to arm yourself in a place where you're not supposed to be armed or not allowed to be armed, how to take personal responsibility for your own safety and that of your family. And how to take some of the weird, horrible lessons that I learned and turn them into learnable experiences. Um, come find me. Uh, uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, look for some of the reviews of the classes that I've done and uh, some of the clients that I have. And uh, I'll, I'll see you out there. Well, yeah, let's see if we can get you uh, in the Houston area. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I do classes out there every now and then. So if I'm out there, definitely. Uh, t- take you guys out uh, and, you know, teach us some weird shit from Mexico. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Muchas gracias y uh, nos vemos. Peace. Bueno.